Welcome to my 90 day SAT prep series. Today is day 86 out of 90. And in today's video, what we're gonna be doing is reviewing and practicing and staying fresh for that reading section of the SAT, which is fast approaching, as you can see, since we are on day 86. So first thing that you're gonna do today is you're gonna answer questions one through 10 of SAT practice test six, the reading test in 11 minutes. So the reasoning behind this, obviously for the pacing, when we talked about the pacing of the SAT reading section, we wanna be completing each passage in anywhere from nine minutes to 11 minutes. So I'll give you that full 11 minutes. You're gonna answer the questions for that first passage of SAT practice test six. Reasoning behind this is we wanna stay fresh. We wanna just stay comfortable with the reading section at this point. At this point, we're really close to the SAT. So we don't wanna push it too hard because we don't want you to be mentally fatigued going into the SAT. We just wanna make sure that we're staying comfortable, staying fresh, and that we're really, really comfortable approaching these questions, especially since you have, if you're taking this 90 day SAT prep series, so much preparation under your belt at this point that we just wanna make sure that you're ready and you're fresh going into that SAT. So not trying to mentally fatigue you too much. You're only gonna be taking two of these SAT reading passages today. So after you answer the questions one through 10, at that point, I'll take you through the answer explanations of that passage. So I'll just be pulling it from my SAT practice test six reading answer explanations video, which I made a while back. So it'll be a little bit over um, 11 minutes just because it's part of a separate video, not part of this series. But either way, the answer explanations, they'll just be more in depth that way. So it'll be helpful in that sense because it's gonna be even more in depth answer explanations than if I was going through 11 minutes. And then after that, you're gonna go ahead and answer questions 42 to 52 of SAT practice test six in 11 minutes. So that'll be your second passage for today. And then after that, once again, I'll take you through the answer explanations of that passage. Once again, pulling from my SAT practice test six reading section video where I went through all of the questions on that. Okay, so this um, the second one, those four questions, I think it's actually questions 43. Let me scratch that out. I believe it's questions 43. It's that last passage. So just the last passage of SAT practice test six. Um, but then after that, once again, I'll take you through those answer explanations of that passage. You can check your answers, see how many you got right, kind of compare your thought process versus my thought process, get an inside look at what I kind of see on the reading section as someone who scored 1590. And then with that, that'll end today's video. So today's video, probably not going to be anything longer than 45, maybe 50 minutes, should be pretty concise. Um, but once again, like I said, we don't want to mentally fatigue you too much going into the SAT. So kind of keeping it light for now, just making sure you're staying comfortable, staying fresh, focused, but still uh, very, very sharp as well. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. I'll go ahead and let you pull up SAT practice test six real quick. It'll be linked in the description. And then in right around 10 seconds here, we'll go ahead and get started. All right. So good luck make sure you pay attention to tips um, any tricks that i pointed out as far as the reading section and strategies try to use those strategies try to focus in and get that answer correct right take it seriously even though obviously you're only doing two passages today so with that i'll go ahead and let your time start now
let's get started with this. The passage is adopted from Daniel Manuendin, Nawabdin, electrician, copyright 2009 by Daniel Manuendin. Another man might have thrown his hands, thrown up his hands, but not Nawabdin. His twelve daughters acted as a spur to his genius, and he looked with satisfaction in the mirror each morning at the face of a warrior going out to do battle. Nawab, of course, knew that he must proliferate his sources of revenue. The salary he received from K.K. Haroni for tending the tube well would not even begin to suffice. He set up a little one-room flour mill run by a condemned electric motor, uh, condemned by him. He tried his hand at fish farming in a little pond at the edge of his master's field, but he brought, he bought broken radios, fixed them, and resold them. He did not demure even when asked to fix watches, though that enterprise did spectacularly badly, in fact, earned him more kicks than kudos, for no watch he took apart ever kept time again. K.K. Haroni rarely went to his farms, but lived mostly in Lahore. Whenever the old man visited, Nawab would place himself night and day at the door leading from the servant's sitting area into the walled grove of ancient banyan trees where the old farmhouse stood. Grizzled, bent, and smudged, Nawab tended the household machinery, the air conditioners, water heaters, refrigerators, and water pumps near tending the boilers on a foundering steamer in an Atlantic gale. By his superhuman efforts, he almost managed to maintain K.K. Haroni in the same mechanical cocoon, cooled and bathed and lighted and fed that the landowner enjoyed in Lahore. Haroni, of course, became familiar with this ubiquitous man who not only accompanied him on his tours of inspection, but morning and night could be found standing on the master bed, rewiring the light fixture in the bathroom, poking at the water heater. Finally, one evening at tea time, gauging the psychological moment, Nawab asked if he might say a word. The landowner, who was cheerfully filing his nails in front of a crackling rosewood fire, told him to go ahead. Sir, as you know, your lands stretch from here to the Indus, and on these lands are fully 17 tube wells, and to tend these 17 tube wells, there is but one man, me, your servant. In your service, I have earned these gray hairs. Here he bowed his head to show the gray, and now I cannot fulfill my duties as I should. Enough, sir, enough, I beg you. Forgive me my weakness. Better a darkened house and proud hunger within than a disgrace in the light of day. Release me, I ask you, I beg you. The old man, well accustomed to these sorts of speeches, though not usually this floor, had filed away at his nails and waited for the breeze to stop. What's the matter, Nawabdin? Matter? Sir, oh, what could be the matter in your service? I've eaten your salt for all my years, but, sir, on the bicycle now, with my old legs and with the many injuries I've received when heavy machinery fell on me, I cannot any longer bicycle about like a bridegroom from farm to farm, as I could when I first had the good fortune to enter your employment. I beg you, sir, let me go. And what's the solution, asked Haroni, seeing that they had come to the crooks? He didn't particularly care one way or the other, except that it touched on his comfort, a matter of great interest to him. Well, sir, if I had a motorcycle, then I could somehow limp along, at least until I train up some younger man. The crops that year had been good. Haruni felt expansive in front of the fire, and so, much to the disgust of the farm managers, Nawab received a brand new motorcycle, a Honda 70. He even managed to extract an allowance for gasoline. The motorcycle increased his status, gave him weight, so that people began calling him uncle and asking his opinions on the world affairs, about which he knew absolutely nothing. He could now range further, doing a much wider business. Best of all, now he could spend every night with his wife, who had begged him to live not on the farm, but near her family in Thyroza, where also they could educate at least the two eldest daughters. A long straight road ran from the canal headworks near Thyroza all the way to the Indus, through the heart of the K.K. Haroni lands. The wab would fly down on his road on his new machine, his bags, uh, with bags and cloths hanging from every knob and brace so that the bike, when he hit, hit a bump, seemed to be flapping numerous small vestigial wings. I'm sorry, vestigial wings, and with his grinning face, <coughs> and with his grinning face as he rolled up to whichever tube well needed servicing, uh, with his ears almost blown off, he shone with the speed of his arrival. Okay, now that I've read through the passage, I'll go ahead and get into my questions. All right, so we have the main purpose of the first paragraph is to what? All right, well, this is obviously a purpose question asking us to find the purpose of that first paragraph. If we really think about that first paragraph, and we'll go ahead and go there real quick, uh, we see that that first paragraph, and I'm going to zoom out a bit so you can see more. Okay, we see our first paragraph. Uh, we really touch on him having uh, his life at home with his 12 daughters, but that's only briefly. And then after that, we really spend the rest of that first paragraph touching on all of his money-making uh, ventures, right? Everything that he does to make money, how he's trying to proliferate his sources of revenue. So literally everything that he's doing uh, to try to increase his income is really all of that. So that's really the main purpose of passage, or I'm sorry, paragraph one, is to describe his various money-making ventures, all the ways he's trying to earn that income. So one is going to be C, as far as why A, B, and D are wrong. A, characterize him as a loving father. That's too narrow. It focuses too much on that first part of that paragraph. Okay, that's too narrow. B, outlining the schedule of a typical day. We don't outline a schedule. We only describe his various money-making ventures. Uh, D, contrasting Naro Nawab's and Haruni's lifestyle. At that point, we don't even know much about Haruni, so we're definitely not contrasting their lifestyles. All right, question two, as used in line 16, kicks most nearly means. Anytime I have a most nearly means question, I go to that line, find the word, and try to come up with my own answer choice uh, first. So line 16, it says that the word is kicks. So let's go there. We see that 
Uh, he did not demur even when asked to fix watches, though that enterprise did spectacularly badly. In fact, he earned more kicks than kudos for no watch he took ever kept time again. Okay, kudos we know as compliments, uh, so kicks would be something like complaints, okay? He's receiving more complaints than compliments, no watch he took apart ever kept time again. Obviously, he's not doing well at fixing those watches. He's receiving a lot of kicks, which means compliments, or I'm sorry, uh, which means complaints, right? Kudos means compliments. Uh, in this case, kicks would mean complaints. So I'm going to look for complaints as an answer. I see I have that in B, so B would be my answer for number two. All right, question three. The author uses the image of an engineer at sea most likely to do what? Okay, this is really a purpose question asking us what's the purpose of making this comparison to an engineer at sea in lines 23 to 28. So let's go to lines 23 to 28, see what it says, come up with our answer for why the author included it. All right, we see that we have uh, 23 starts down here. We've got grizzled, his peculiar aviator glasses, bent and smudged. Uh, Nawab tended the household machinery, the air conditioners, water heaters, refrigerators, and water pumps like an engineer tending the boilers on a foundering steamer in an Atlantic gale. Okay. One thing to know, engineers who are tending the boilers on a foundering steamy or on a foundering steamer, okay, a steamer is a type of ship, and the boilers are in the boiler room, and the engineers who tend to those, that boiler room is like over a hundred degrees. It's super hot and it's really, really hard work, much like this hard work of the household machinery, uh, tending to all of that, the air conditioners, water heaters, and fridges. So it's really showing the difficulty and physical strain that Nawab endures in his job or in his occupation. Okay, so let's look at our options here. Uh, a suggests that Nawab often dreams of having a more exciting profession. No, it's not about him dreaming to be an engineer. A is wrong. B, highlighting the fact that Nawab's primary job is to tend to Haruni's tube wells. No, we're highlighting that physical strain, so we're trying to find an answer choice that has that. C, reinforcing the idea that Nawab has had many different occupations in his life. No, we actually know that Nawab has pretty much worked for uh, Haruni for pretty much all of his life, so that's going to be wrong. D, emphasize how demanding Nawab's work for Haruni is. Yes, right, we're showing how demanding it is. Uh, it's demanding like the work of an engineer uh, in a steam or a, or a boiler room. All right, so now we got question four. Which choice best supports the claim that Nawab performs his duties for Haruni well? Well, that's going to be where we talk about him um, pretty much working, uh, having superhuman efforts, I believe was the word right here. Okay, it's in the top right of our screen. I'm going to uh, switch to a blue pen so you can see the difference a little bit. By his superhuman efforts, he almost managed to maintain KK Haruni in the same mechanical cocoon, cooled and bathed, lighted and fed that the landowner enjoyed in Lahore. Okay, that's really showing he works very, very hard uh, to keep this landowner, Mr. Haruni, in that same sort of mechanical cocoon or that same sort of uh, high-class living that he enjoys in Lahore, which is his more city home, his more luxurious home. Um, so that was lines, I believe it was 28 to 32, and it was, so that's going to be answer choice A for number four. So A would be our answer for number four. That's really showing that he performs those duties well. All right, now we got question five. Uh, in the context of the conversation between Nawab and Haruni, Nawab's comments in lines 43 to 52 serve to do what? This is a purpose question asking us what the purpose of those lines is. So we'll go quick, take a look at that, come up with our own answer choice first. Uh, so it's lines 43 to 52. Uh, we see it starts up here. We have, sir, as you know, your land stretched from here to the Indies. Uh, we talk about how there's 17 tube wells. He's the only one servicing them. We talk about how he has earned these gray hairs in his service to Haruni. He bows his head, shows his gray hairs. Uh, he talks about how he's getting very old. Um, he talks about how he wants to be released. So really the big thing here is he's talking about how he's gotten these gray hairs in his service, um, how he's gotten old, but how he's really done a great job being loyal to Haruni over the years. So really focusing in on uh, Haruni's loyalty, or I'm sorry, Nawab's royalty to, man, Nawab's loyalty to Haruni is really what we're focusing on there. So that's going to be answer choice C, emphasizing Nawab's diligence and loyalty to Haruni because he's earned those gray hairs working for Haruni. Um, as far as why A is wrong, flatter Haruni by mentioning how vast his lands are. He's not trying to flatter him. He's trying to show his dedication. B, boasting about how competent and reliable. Uh, he's actually saying he's unreliable now because he's gotten old and he's asking to be released. So that's going to be wrong as well. Uh, D, notifying, Har notifying Harani he intends to quit. No, he's asking permission to quit. He doesn't intend to yet. He's asking permission to. So five there is going to have to be C. All right, question six. Nawab uses the word bridegroom mainly to, ser to emphasize he's no longer what? All right, this is a words and context question. It said bridegroom was in line 62. I'm going to find that real quick, uh, figure out my answer. So I have, I cannot any longer bicycle about like a bridegroom from farm to farm, as I could when I first had the good fortune to enter your employment. Okay, when he first entered his employment, he was young, okay, and he was able to bike like a bridegroom, but now he's old and he can't bike like a bridegroom. Okay, so this is really showing that uh, he used to be younger. Okay, that's really what we're focusing in on there. Okay, it emphasizes that he's no longer young. So 6D would be our correct answer there. Nothing to do with love or naivety or being busy. It has to do with age. So our answer there is going to be D for number six. Question seven. 
It can be reasonably inferred from the passage that Haruni provides Nawab with a motorcycle, mainly because what? Well, we know that that's because Haruni enjoys his lavish lifestyle, and he wants to maintain that, so it's really a selfish decision to do it. Okay, so that's going to be answer choice B. He sees benefit to himself from giving Nawab a motorcycle. He knows by giving Nawab a motorcycle, he can maintain that luxurious lifestyle because Nawab has always done a good job of maintaining that uh, that residence for him. So seven, answer is going to be B there. Um, if we have an evidence question for the next one, that'd be nice because I already know where the evidence would be. Okay, we do have an evidence question, so I'll go ahead and find that. That's going to be where we talk about how he makes uh, decisions selfishly um, right here. Okay, he says he didn't particularly care one way or the other, except that it touched on his comfort and matter of great interest to him. Okay, really focusing in on this part right here, that his greatest interest is in his own comfort. So that's 66 uh, through 68. So that's going to be my evidence there, 66 through 68. Let's see if we have an answer choice for that. And we see that we do. So that's going to be answer choice B for number eight. All right, question nine. And I'm going to switch back to my black pen because it's thinner. Uh, the passage states the farm managers react to Nawab receiving a motorcycle with what? Okay, that's disgust. How did I know that so quickly? Well, I actually recall that it said exactly that, that word, disgust. And I'll go ahead and find that for you. Uh, it's up here. We see that we've got um, right here. So we've got line 70 through 72 is where it starts. The crops had been good that year. Haruni felt expansive in front of the fire and so much to the disgust of the farm managers. Okay, when we say much to the disgust of the farm managers, that's showing those farm managers are reacting to Nawab receiving that motorcycle with disgust. So since it's literally giving us the word there, we know the answer there has to be disgust. Okay, now we got question 10, last question for this passage. According to the passage, what does Nawab consider the best result of getting the motorcycle? Okay, that's going to be that he can spend more time with his wife. All right, how do we know that? Well, it actually explicitly says that. So we know why A, B, C, A, B and C are wrong because it explicitly says he can spend more time with his wife. I'll quick show you where that's at as well. Uh, that's going to be up here when he says um, right here, best of all. Okay, best of all is telling us that that's the most important thing to him. That's what he sees as the best part of getting that motorcycle. He could spend every night with his wife. So that's explicitly saying that the best part of getting that motorcycle is he can now spend every night with his wife. So we know that 10, uh, for 10, him spending time with his wife is going to be the obvious answer there. All right, so with that, we can go ahead and move on to passage two.
All right, let's get going through passage five here. So questions 40 through 50 through 52 are based on the following. The passage is adopted from Kevin Bullis, What Tech is Next for the Solar Industry, copyright 2013 by MIT Technology Review. Solar panel installations continue to grow quickly, but the solar panel manufacturing industry is in the doldrums because supply far exceeds demand. The poor market may be slowing innovation, but advances continue. Judging by the mood this week at the IEEE photovoltaics specialist conference in Tampa, Florida, people in the industry remain optimistic about its long-term prospects. The technology that surprised almost everyone in convention is conventional crystalline silicon. A few years ago, silicon solar panels cost $4 per watt, and Martin Green, professor at the University of New South Wales and one of the leading silicon solar panel researchers, declared that they'd never go below $1 a watt. Now it's down to something like $0.50 cents a watt, and there's talk of hitting $0.36 cents per watt, he says. The U.S. Department of Energy has set a goal of reaching less than a dollar per watt, not just for the solar panels, but for complete installed systems by 2020. Green thinks that the solar industry will hit that target even sooner than that. If so, that could that would bring about, or I'm sorry, if so, that would bring the direct cost of solar power to six cents per kilowatt hour, which is cheaper than the average cost uh, expected for power from new natural gas power plants. All parts of the silicon solar panel industry have been looking for ways to cut costs and improve the power output of solar panels, and that's led to steady cost reductions. Green points to something as mundane as the pace used to screen print some of the features of solar panels. Green Labs, Green's lab built a solar cell in the 1990s that set a record efficiency for silicon solar cells, a record that stands to this day. To achieve that record, he had to use expensive lithography techniques to make fine wires for collecting current from the solar cell. But gradual improvements have made it possible to use screen printing to produce ever finer lines. Recent research suggests that screen printing techniques can produce lines as thin as 30 micrometers, about the width of the lines Green used for his record solar cells, but at costs far lower than his lithography techniques. Meanwhile, researchers at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory have made flexible solar cells on a new type of glass from corn and called willow glass, which is thin and can be rolled up. This type of solar cell they made is the only current challenger to silicon in terms of large scale production, thin film, cadmium, telluride, Flexible solar cells could lower the cost of installing solar cells, making solar power cheaper. One of Green's former students and colleagues, Juana Zhao, co-founder of solar panel manufacturer China Sunergy, announced this week that he is building a pilot manufacturing line for a two-sided solar cell that can absorb light from both the front and back. The basic idea, which isn't new, is that during some parts of the day, sunlight falls on the land between rows of solar panels and a solar power plant. That light reflects onto the back of those panels and can be harvested to increase the power output. This works particularly well when the solar panels are built on sand, which is highly reflective. Where a one-sided solar panel might generate 340 watts and a two-sided one might generate up to 400 watts. He expects the panels to generate uh, 10 to 20 percent more electricity over the course of a year. Even longer term, Green is betting on silicon, aiming to take advantage of huge reductions in cost already seen with the technology. He hopes to greatly increase the efficiency of silicon solar panels by combining silicon with one or two other semiconductors, each selected to efficiently convert a part of the solar spectrum that silicon doesn't convert efficiently. Adding one semiconductor could boost efficiencies from, 20 to, from the 20 to 25% range to around 40%. Adding another could make efficiencies as high as 50% feasible, which would cut in half the number of solar panels needed for a given installation. The challenge is to produce good connections between these semiconductors, something made challenging by the arrangement of silicon atoms and crystalline silicon. Okay, then I have two uh, two graphs, and now we're going to go ahead and get into our questions. So the passage is written from the point of view of what? Well, let's just run through A through D, and let's see. Uh, we obviously know it's written from the point of view of someone who's really talking about the changes that are going on in the solar industry. Okay, so we're really looking for that. Um, it's kind of tough to tell who exactly is writing it. I would say that's going to be either the perspective, um, not of a scientist, so I can get rid of B, right? It's not from the scientist. It's really from the perspective um, of a journalist who's enumerating these changes in a field, okay? They're talking about how solar used to be very expensive and have low power output. Now we are increasing our power output and decreasing our cost, okay? Where it's not from a hobbyist, because a hobbyist wouldn't be writing like this, right? A hobbyist would be using more slang, more casual terms, not explaining as much. Um, he's not explaining um, necessarily the new capabilities of technology either. We're really talking about those changes in that field, that lowering of cost, increasing of power output. Also, definitely not a consumer writing this. Um, Question 44, as used in line four, poor most nearly means what? Well, let's go take a look at what it says. So we've got the poor market may be slowing innovation, but advances continue. And I see before that I have because supply far exceeds demand. Okay, if supply far exceeds demand in a market, we would describe that market as poor or as a weak market. Okay, the demand is weak. Um, the market is weak for that product. Okay, so I'm really looking for weak there. That would be my best answer choice if I have that. I see I do have that, right? We would not describe a market as humble. A market cannot be humble. A market can't really be pitiable either. Um, as far as obsolete, the market is not obsolete because there is still um, demand there, okay? It's not completely gone. 
45, it can be most reasonably inferred from the passage that many people in the solar industry believe what? Okay, well, many people in the solar industry are believing that the cost of these solar panels is too high and their power output is too low, right? They talk about how they need to have cost reductions before this really um, is viable as an alternative to uh, natural gas and other forms of energy use. So they're really, really talking about how they need to drop that cost if they want this to really work out. All right, so that's 45. 45, we know our answer there is going to be C. As far as why A, B, and D are wrong, let's quick cover that. Uh, consumers don't understand how solar panels work. We never make that claim. Um, B, two-sided cells have weaknesses not yet discovered. We also never make that claim. D, willow glass is too inefficient to be marketable. Once again, never make that claim. Uh, 46, uh, we're asked for evidence. Okay, so that's going to be where we talk about how the cost is too high, right, and power output too low. I see that that's going to be right here. All parts of the silicon solar panel industry have been looking for ways to cut costs and improve power output of solar panels, and that's led to steady cost reductions. So I see that's from 27 to 30, so that's going to be my evidence there. Okay, so with evidence questions, always try to remember where that best evidence is. I see my answer then for 46 is going to be D. All right, question 47. According to the passage, two-sided solar panels will likely raise efficiency by doing what? Well, we talk about how those two-sided solar panels, right? And we are, we're asked for evidence, so I'll go and show you where this is as well. We talk about how those two-sided solar panels will collect that light that reflects off the ground or off that sand it talked about. Um, so right here, okay, the light reflects onto the back of the panels. It could be harvested to increase power output, okay? So increasing power output, increasing efficiency by capturing that light. So that's 61 to 62 would be my evidence there. So 61 to 62, so that's going to be B for 48. Okay, as far as what 47 is going to be, they're raising that efficiency by absorbing that reflected light. So 47 there, that's going to be B, right? We're absorbing that reflected light off the ground. Uh, we're not requiring little energy to operate or being reasonably inexpensive to manufacture um, and preventing light from reaching the ground. That would, that is not what we're doing. So D is also incorrect. Uh, 48 already answered that one. Now we're down to 49. As used in line 69, betting on is most nearly means what? Well, let's go take a look at betting on, come up with what it most nearly means. We know it was line 69. I'll go ahead and make sure I box that term up so you can see it. It's right here. Okay, so we have even longer term. Green is betting on silicon, aiming to take advantage of the huge reductions in cost already seen with the technology. Okay, green betting on silicon here uh, basically means he's counting on silicon or relying on silicon or thinks it's going to be um, a positive thing, right? He's very, very optimistic about it. So anything like that. So anything where it says he's optimistic about it or he's relying on silicon, counting on silicon, Anything like that would be a great option. Uh, I see I don't have anything as counting on re or relying on silicon, but I do have optimistic about, which is what he is. He's optimistic about it. He's betting on it. He is counting on it, relying on it. He thinks it's going to work. Uh, he's not saying switch from it. He's not gambling with it, um, and he's not dabbling in it either. He's very, very all in with this. He's not dabbling. He's betting on it, right? He's optimistic about it. Uh, 50, the last sentence of the passage mainly serves to do what? Let's go take a look at what that sentence is. Come up with our own answer first so we don't get stuck between two. Okay, I have recent research, or I'm sorry, that's the wrong part, right here on the right side. The challenge is to produce good connections between these semiconductors. Okay, a challenge, which means we have an obstacle we're going to have to overcome. Uh, something made challenging by the arrangement of silicon atoms in a crystalline silicone. Okay, we're really describing a challenge that the solar industry still faces. So we're looking for something that describes an obstacle that must be, must be overcome for the industry. So let's go through A through D, see what has that. Uh, A, express concerns about the limitation of material, no. B, identify a hurdle that must be overcome. Yes, right? We talked about identifying an obstacle or a challenge. We talked about it has to be overcome, that challenge of converting that energy, right? So that challenge we talked about at the end, that is a hurdle that has to be overcome for the solar industry to be um, improved. So B would be our correct answer for 50. Uh, 51, according to figure one in 2017, the cost of which of the following fuels is projected to be close to the 2009 average. All right, in figure two, it says. So 2009 average cost was $120 uh, per megawatt hour. Let's take a look at which one uh, crosses that or is closest to that. I see 120 is going to be right around here, and I see that that's advanced nuclear. So advanced nuclear would be my, my answer for uh, 51. I see that that's going to be answer choice D. 52, according to figure 2, in what year is the average cost of solar photovoltaic power projected to equal the 2009 cost? Okay, so this is figure 2. We find where that 2009 is going to intersect our projection. We see that that's in year 2020. So answer there is going to be 2020. All right, so that takes us through this section. Um, I so hopefully this video was helpful. If it was, there will be a donation link in the description if you would like to donate. These videos take a lot of time, effort, and planning, so I definitely appreciate that. Uh, additionally, any private SAT tutoring I'm doing, private college admissions consulting, private college essay proofreading I'm doing will also be linked in the description. So as always, thank you for watching. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe, and have a great day.